And today we have uh, another draft profile, uh, Timur Mukhanov, a Russian forward. Graham Montgomery makes his Locked on Sharks debut to help profile um, a, the Russian forward and why he is such an intriguing plus. What Graham would do at number four. So uh, all that and more on today's episode of Locked on Sharks. Your Locked on Sharks, your daily podcast on the San Jose Sharks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, welcome to Locked On Sharks, the premier hockey podcast of your favorite team in the Bay Area. My name is Jade Young, contributor to San Jose Hockey Now. I want to thank you for making Locked on Sharks your first listen, proudly a part of the Locked on Network, where we cover your team every day. And if you want to be an everydayer, all you got to do is just come back tomorrow. Uh, so make sure you guys are following along or subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And of course, you can watch on YouTube as well. And uh, we have Graham Montgomery from Dara Prospects. He makes his Locked on Sharks debut uh, where we talk about uh, one, uh, Timur uh, Mukhanov and why he's such an intriguing prospect despite, despite being uh, one of our short kings at five foot eight. So um, without further ado, let's get into it with Graham and talk about Timur Mukhanov. And now we bring in Graham Montgomery, uh, a.k.a. Grand Slam YT, uh, as you guys all know from Twitter, uh, who covers prospects at Dauber uh, Prospects. Graham, making his Lockdown Strikes debut. How's it going, buddy? It's doing pretty well. Uh, I started, you know, getting into the draft really seriously about a year ago, and this was kind of one of my big goals was to, you know, get on to Locked On or specifically Locked On Sharks because I'm a Sharks fan. So it's pretty cool to be here. Uh, you got to aim higher, buddy. Uh, <laughs> you got to aim higher. Well, okay, that's not the ultimate goal, you know, <laughs> but it was one of them. It was one of them. So uh, I do enjoy the uh, representing Scouch RIP shirt. So uh, definitely definitely a plus in the book. So um, you wanted to talk about Timur, uh, Timur Mukhanov, uh, a cent or a forward from Russia. Um, let's get to know him a little bit. So he is a, uh, a forward, five foot eight, 170 pounds in the MHL this year. He played uh, the majority of his games. He had 31 games, four goals, four assists, 57 shots on goal. Um, he also played, had a game in the KHL and then played, um, uh, sorry, he played 31 games in the VHL, my bad. Uh, then he also played 15 games in the MHL where he had uh, 17 points in 15 games as well. So uh, I'm going to start asking what I ask uh, everybody. What makes uh, Mukhanov such an interesting prospect to you? So first, I just want to uh, touch on the leagues he's played in a little bit this year because he's played the all system, of them. <laughs> yeah, the, Rus the Russian system is is confusing at times and there's you know it's well known that young players generally don't get a lot of ice time in mm. the pro leagues the khl and the vhl which is kind of their version of the ahl i suppose um and in that one khl game in fact he actually did not take a single shift he had zero zero of ice time so technically he was on the team sure didn't touch the ice but in the vhl you know that's where he spent the majority of the year and i think that's what makes him a little bit more interesting than some other Russian prospects with similar profiles because that is a pro league playing against men. And he is listed at five foot eight, 170 uh, pounds. I don't know how much I believe either of those things. Shorter? Um, <laughs> no, I actually do think he is a bit taller. He doesn't okay. look quite that small uh, mm -hmm. in the VHL games, but he also, I'm not sure that he's 170 pounds though. He might be a little bit more slight than that. Um, but what really makes him really intriguing i think is his playmaking abilities so i don't think he's like an elite passer or somebody who has like game breaking vision or anything like that but his processing speed is really high he mm -hmm. anticipates the game really well he sees plays developing before they happen and he just he also has really good scanning habits so he also always knows where his teammates are and is really good at predicting where they're going to be, you know, two, three, four seconds ahead of time. So 
he doesn't need to make like a spectacular pass or something like that to make his game work. So I also think that's why he's done so well at the VHL level this season, because as somebody who is, you know, supposedly five foot eight, 170 pounds, you know, it's, and in the Russian system where it's, you know, it's not easy for draft eligible players to get significant ice time in these higher leagues. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that processing speed is really what has allowed him to be successful at that level. And going forward, I think that's going to be the foundation that his game relies on. So, I mean, we know the Sharks, at least before, we know they, their hockey IQ, their intelligence, that processing speed, right? William Eckler, that was kind of his calling card coming out of the draft. But there's one of his, his, his ability to process and see things ahead, right? Bordelo, the same thing. Just his ability to kind of process and see the game happening, you know, before it's happening. Um, that that sounds very in, intriguing to me. I, I, I You guys know I bring on all the offense. Um, I like guys who do offensive things. So um, other than his processing, what do you think is kind of – his next kind of staple or what do you think is going to help kind of push him to be an NHL player? You know, in general, he's just really smart Mm -hmm. and he's also not as much of a liability on, on defense as you might expect, you know, from somebody who is listed as as a center, I think more than likely he's going to be playing the wing at higher levels of hockey. And he is even already playing, uh, at the wing for most of what I've seen from him this year. Um, and for a winger, you know, his defensive impact is actually pretty solid. I mm-hmm. think he could be potentially a pretty decent two-way guy. And that's not something that I think you see very often from players with this kind of profile, especially from Russia. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think he's a guy that you don't, you're probably not going to have to worry about as much as you might traditionally think when you know you have a player of this size all right and we know his size is is definitely going to be a factor right i mean there's no way about it and uh i'm sure there's plenty of gms who are just be like he's small and he's russian i don't want to deal with it type of of of, unfortunately um other than the size what do you think is gonna be the one thing that you know is going to hold him back or the thing that he needs to kind of work on the most as he continues to get more pro games and earn ice time and eventually you know khl ice time and then eventually come over to to north america so the main thing that does kind of concern me or concern me with him a little bit is his skating okay which is particularly concerning for a player of his size yes but you know he's just he he has a pretty good amount of lateral mobility he's pretty mobile going side to side i would say Mm -hmm. but his top speed is not very good Um, especially for a player of his size he uses he uses crossovers to generate speed uh and i think his uh technique as a skater is pretty solid he -hmm. just needs to get a little more lower body strength i think to really give himself a little bit more separation speed so that he can be more effective in transition. Um, now he had, I think he recognizes that his skating is a weakness in his game mm-hmm. and that combines the size. He has adapted his game around that. So, you know, I have found myself surprised at times by some of the things he is capable of doing just because he is really anticipating that play uh you know two three seconds because when you have such a big head start when you know where the play is going over other players you know that's a huge advantage and even though you might not be as fast as the other players on the ice you're still able to get a step on them and he's still able to generate odd man rushes and breakaways for himself doing that so i think he already has uh adapted his game relatively well for this weakness in his skating which i think makes his uh, projectability to higher levels of hockey a little bit more solid. A little, There's less question marks there for me. All right, guys, before we continue with Graham, uh, we uh, you know look at where Mugunev would kind of fit in the Sharks prospect pool, uh, you know, kind of where he would kind of sack him up. 
all of all that fun stuff. Do need to take a quick break. Talk to you guys about our friends at Athletic Greens. And we know summer is right around the corner. Um, and getting keeping proper nutrition is hard. You're busy, you're stuck, you're at your desk. Um, maybe you're out running around with, with all the fun summer stuff going on. Uh, whatever you're doing right now just to kind of get through day by day, Athletic Greens can help you guys get control of your nutrition um, and have the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. With a single scoop of AG1 in a glass of water, you can do just about do just that and absorb 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and aptogens to help start your day, right? Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up with a complicated supplement routine to recover. It cost him over $100 a day, which just isn't sustainable. He created Athletic Greens with after experiencing how difficult it was to create an optimal nutrition routine on your own, you did this all for just around $3 a day. So right now, it's time to reclaim your health, arm your immune system with a convenient daily nutrition. To make it easy, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs for your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network. Again, it's athleticgreens.com slash angel network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. And another thing, too, is he's really young. Like his birthday is not until he doesn't turn 18 until June, mid June. So, um, you know, right before the draft here. So he could be one of those players where maybe just a bit of a late bloomer, right? Maybe. I was a late bloomer. I didn't, I added like two inches between my junior and senior year. Uh, you know, he might be one of those guys who, again, you're five foot eight. And then by the time he's, you know, getting ready to come over here, you might be closer to five foot 10 and five foot 11. Who knows? I'm just speculating here. And then with the, yeah. you're saying the skating side with the skating again, as he matures and grows, he's going to get a stronger, you know, if his frame if he grows a little bit bigger, you know, he's going to be able to add muscle to a frame. And if that's basically all he needs to kind of really help with his skating, especially if uh, his top end skating, you know, is just getting that, that, that actual strength and stuff. It might be someone again, who's kind of a diamond in the rough, especially at the end of the, or wherever we kind of project him as well, we will hear in a little bit, um, you know, and then you combine that with the smarts that, that sounds, there's a lot of stuff to be really, really intrigued with, with him. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing is that he just strikes me as a really mature player, at least mm -hmm. on the ice. Of course, you know, I'm not scouting him in person. I'm not going to Russia or anything like anything crazy like that. So not dedicated you know, to the game. Yeah. Graham. I am, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you just you got to make some sacrifices sometimes. But, yes. um, you know. His game very mature. Yes. Uh, on the ice. I'm sorry. Yes, I distracted. There. Yeah, it's it's it's. it's it's hard to say for certain because, you know, I haven't had a chance to see, you know, interviews of him. You know, I don't speak Russian. When yeah. you look at a player like Connor Bedard, for example, you know, there's that uh, post-game interview from the World Juniors, I believe, that kind of went viral where he's like, it's not about me. It's about the team. Like, we, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that demonstrates a lot of maturity to me and, like, uh, leadership qualities. So I don't know. I haven't seen anything like that from Mukinov because I've only just been watching him actually play on mm -hmm. the ice. But just by looking at the way he plays on the ice, he does strike me as a really mature player. And I think part of that is like the defensive. He's buying in defensively and he's playing in the men's league. And, you know, he just doesn't do anything that is going to make the coach, you know, staple him to the bench for the rest of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, so, again, I think that that adds a little bit more to – uh, not just his projectability, but also like that's the kind of guy you want in in your system. You know, the Sharks have had taken risks on prospects in the past, like guys like Ryan Merkley, who, you know, supposedly had some like maturity issues or potentially yep. character issues in general. And, you know, I didn't really buy that too much. But, you know, here we are and Merkley's not in the organization anymore. So. I think with Mook Kinev, that's not something you're going to have to worry about. Yeah, and I mean, we've seen with Mike Greer, right? He's very quickly uh, kind of reshaped this prospect pool, especially on the blue line and adding his guys. And, you know, he talked about uh, – Shang had a great article um, on San Jose Hockey Now. It's under the paywall, but uh, if you haven't – if you haven't subscribed, go subscribe to, to Shank's work because he deserves all the money. Um, but he talked uh, without giving away too much, but he talked about how Greer wants those kind of competitive guys, but those guys who are going to be leaders and, you know, kind of be part of the culture and kind of, especially with the Sharks right now, where they're trying to kind of 
revamp and refigure out their culture, um, being part of that next wave of sharks. And, um, you know, I think they take that very, very seriously and who they're looking for. Not only are they a great player, but are they the right guys that you can kind of build around, you know, and you see guys like William Eklund, who, you know, I've gotten to talk to off the ice and stuff, but that he's hockey, he's hockey. He's, you know, that's, that's all he cares about, right. Is hockey. And then just, you know, hanging out with his family. That's, that's, I think those are the type of guys my career wants. It's those guys where it's hockey, hockey, and, you know, and the, your family and like kind of like that close knit kind of feel, if that makes sense. So um, if the sharks do dra- draft uh, Mukunov, where would you kind of shuffle them in with with the the, the among the forward prospects, right? Um, you assume whoever they pick at four is going to be their number one prospect. Um, I'm going to have Eklund number two. There's some people who would pick Bortolo, et cetera, et cetera. Where would you kind of slot him in? You know, I think he would, at the very least, I think he projects to be somewhere in like this a similar-ish kind of player to a guy like Tristan Robbins. Okay. Um, so I'd probably put him like in terms of the like ranking the Sharks prospects, I'd have him below Gushin for sure. Um, and then, you know, as well as Eklund and, and Bordalo, probably right in there with Robbins, maybe like a, maybe a touch ahead of Brandon Co. Okay. Um, but for different reasons. Um, you know, somewhere somewhere in that range. Like he's he's not a game breaking prospect. Uh, he's not going to be like jumping straight to the top of, of the Sharks board. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, he could be a decent a decent guy in their pool and, you know, could be a decent middle six option going forward. So that's going to be kind of my, my next question was, where would you, everything works out, right? Hits his ceiling. What type of player uh, would the Sharks get if everything, you know, kind of he maxes out on everything? Yeah, so I think if he really hits his maximum potential, you're looking at a second line complementary guy, mm-hmm. kind of like a William Eklund light. Uh, Eklund, I think, is more like a, a top line complementary guy. Uh, whereas, as we know, both have our William Eklund jerseys in the background, yes, yes. of course. Uh, <laughs> huge, huge William Eklund fan here, yes. Um, but you know, take that down a notch, lower the expe- expectations a little bit, like a second line version. And, you know, maybe at the end of the day, that's what Eklund becomes. We don't know. Yeah. But uh, Mukanov, if he really hits his peak, that that could be where he's at. And he's a guy that makes his teammates better, makes his line mates better. Mm-hmm. So he's a guy that can really make a, a line in the NHL, I think, work. You might have two guys that are like really skilled, but aren't necessarily like gelling together really well. You throw Mukanov on that line. And I think potentially, you know, he could be a little bit of a glue guy, a guy who, uh, you know, is makes life easier for, for his line mates. So I think, yeah. you know, maximum, maximum potential, you're getting a second line, maybe like 55, 60, 55 to 65 point guy, probably a lot more assists than goals. I don't yep. think he's, too much of a goal scorer um kind of but, almost like know. a barabanov light right yeah actually barabanov is is a reasonable uh comparison i think barabanov is a little bit more of a i wouldn't say power forward but he has more of a, like a, a physical element to yeah. his game um but like Lukanov, we saw barabanov play with couture and that line just started working right because like, yes they're bad off yeah. very much kind of can do what you need if you need him to be the transition guy if you need him to kind of forecheck and then yeah i i, I think a bear band of light from what it sounds like similar role yeah i think most likely he's going to end up on a third line and play like kind of a similar role but if mm. we're being honest Bear Banoff would probably be playing on a third line on a lot of teams teams as well. (laughs) So I think really, I mean, you could be getting, at least in terms of like results and production, you might be getting a relatively similar player to Bear Banoff. All right, guys, before we continue with Graham, we start looking at asking what he would do uh, with the fourth pick in the draft. Um, Spoiler, he goes Russian. Uh, But... He makes his he makes a very compelling argument uh, why he would go with Nichkov. And then we ask him what he, guys he likes at the end of the, the first round. Um, before we do that, do want to let you guys know uh, or thank you guys 
for making Lockdown Sharks your first listen. Um, if you want to be an everydayer, just come back tomorrow. Where we're going to be doing uh, mock drafts galore. So we're probably going to be doing probably a couple of them. Look at you know how the board could break potentially break for the Sharks. You know who we would take at number who I would take at number four, depending on who's there. Um, and then at twenty six, and then at thirty six. So um, if you like mock drafts, tomorrow is the day. So we're going to be doing a, a bunch of mock drafts uh, tomorrow. Uh, so make sure you guys are following along wherever you get podcasts. And of course, you can watch on YouTube as well. There. All right. So we, we talked about uh, Mukhanov. Um, let's get into some bigger draft stuff. So, uh, Graham, congratulations. You're now uh, Mike Greer. Um, congratulations on the new job. Uh, you have pick number four. Uh, we'll say pick number one, Bedard. Pick number two, Fantilli. We'll say Columbus goes way off the board and picks like a Ryan Leonard or somebody, not one of the big three. Um, who are you picking at number four? Make your case. I want Iguadala. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I would take Michkov. Okay. Michkov is, is my guy for four. I'm, I can't. I don't remember. I was just catching up on a lot of your episodes on draft profiles earlier. Don't remember who it was that said this specifically, but it, it might have been Hottie. I don't remember who he argued for. Um, Tony, Ar- somebody- Tony argued for Carlson. Um, yeah. Sam argued for uh, for Mitchkoff, and I think Hottie argued for Mitchkoff too recently. So, yep. Okay, yeah. It it might have been Hottie who said Mitchkoff is a potential Hall of Famer. Um. And that, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, that, that end, end of argument right there. I mean, Leo Carlson, I think is going to be a really, really good player in the national hmm. hockey league. He's going to be a top line player, most likely top line center. Um, maybe a guy who gives you like 80, 85, 90 points, even is good defensively kind of good at everything. Yep. Mishkov is the type of guy who I think is going to come in in three or three years and he's going to be like Kirill Kaprizov. You know, I think this is a guy who is potentially going to be like a 95, hundred point guy, a guy who can score 40 to 50 goals maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, and just absolutely change the franchise. Uh, you know, Kaprizov was kind of a little bit, a little bit of a, of a nobody, you know, he went in the fifth round. Yeah. Um, Michkov is like the same type of player, but with all the hype, so the the hype was gone with, with uh, Kaprizov for, you know, whatever reason I wasn't really scouting back then. Yeah. Um, it's absolutely there with Michkov. And I think you're probably getting a similar player in terms of their impact on the organization. And, you know, there's, the Russian factor and this, that, and the other thing. I I don't really care about that kind of stuff. Um, at the end of the day, I think he's coming over. He has stated that he does want to come over. I don't think there's any grand conspiracy. Like, the government's going to keep him from coming. I don't think he's going to sign, like, a 10-year extension in the KHL or anything like that. He's going to come over in three years, and he's, he's going to win the Calder the year he comes over. Like, if he doesn't, I would be – extremely surprised um and on top of all of that you know the sharks don't really have a lot of goal scorers in their prospect pool right now you know gushin is i think underrated i think he's a really good uh goal scorer you know bordolo i think kind of added a little bit more goal scoring this year than we've seen in the past but you know still no goals at the nhl level kind of cooled off a little bit towards the end of the season Yep. Eklund, not really known as a goal scorer. You know, Robbins is like, okay, he's got a decent shot, but, you know, he's really – Robbins tops out like a 25 goal like, scorer type of guy, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. So, but. Um, and Mich- Michkov, Michkov is, is a bona fide like 40 goal scorer, I think, so. He, yeah, as you said, he changes – I think he changes your franchise. Like, and I mean, we, we – the Wild have been one of the most boring franchises for the past 10 plus years. Sorry, sorry, Seth. Um, but once they got Kaprizov over here, like Kaprizov is much watch TV, must watch TV, right? Like he's if Kaprizov's on and like the Sharks aren't playing, if Kaprizov's on, like I'm going to 
cool, I'm going to watch Kaprizov because you never know what he could do type of thing. And the Sharks just haven't had a player like that since Joe Thornton, the Joe Thornton trade, you know? Um, like Joe Thornton changed the Sharks franchise, right? Kirill, or Kirill Kaprizov. Kirill Kaprizov could change the Sharks franchise too. Uh, but Michkov, Michkov could change the Sharks franchise if they draft him and he is what we expect him to be. So um, the good thing is, I think no matter what, who they walk away at four, they're gonna you're gonna feel good about who you walk away with. I mean, there's always gonna be the what happens if you know that that sliding doors moment of who they pick there is definitely gonna be debated by Sharks fans for the next 20 plus years. Um, but I mean they're they're gonna be they're gonna be a good spot. So um all right, before we get out of here, 26, who are you hoping for? Who's the who's the guy that you're hoping for at 26? Probably another Russian, uh Dmitry Simashev. I I absolutely love Simashev. I'm like the biggest Simashev fan that exists, maybe. I don't know. Um, I have him, I think, at nine on my board right now. Mm. Um, I I don't know if he's gonna be available at 26 or not. It's it's really kind of 50 you never 50. know yeah yep i could i could see him falling into the second round i could also see him going like you know 10 yep. overall i mean maybe not 10th but you know he could go i could see a team like taking a swing on him pretty early in the draft you know he, he's big he's a good skater at, and that kind of counters counteracts some of the russian factors maybe i don't know but mm. i do think there's a legitimate chance at least that he's at 26 so that's kind of you know my number one target other guys that I would be like really happy with there though would be like Andrew Crystal potentially like a very different player but tons yeah. of upside with Crystal, um, especially as your second pick of the draft. I think that you know helps mitigate a little bit of the risk. You don't look as bad if you miss on him, which I don't think you're going to be missing on him. I think Crystal is going to be fantastic. Um, Jaden Perron mm, is another guy, um, but ultimately I think my number one is uh, is Simashev. All right, we'll get you out here in the last two questions. So um, five years from now, I'm still doing this podcast because Locked On can't find anybody better to replace me with. Um, who is the best non-Connor Bedard player in the draft? Matt Mavichkov. All right, and then where where does Timur Mukhanov go? Give me a pick. Okay, so... You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up cap friendly here, really quick, just to help me out, um, <laughs> because I have a very specific spot that I think he's gonna go at, um, and it's not. Unfortunately, I don't think the Sharks are gonna draft him, um, because the type of players, this type of player, one team I think in the league is always drafting these guys. And that would it's be the Carolina, Carolina Hurricanes. Sixty-two. Yes. <laughs> So I'm gonna have him. They have two fifth round picks. I'll, I'll 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 have them take him with their own fifth. So I don't know exactly what pick that is, but he strikes me as the kind of guy that's gonna go late in the draft. Um, so fifth round, sure, why not? You know, they got Trikazov last year, and they got Grudinin in like the sixth round, I think. So Carolina, of course, good luck. Yeah, that's I guess. what they're gonna do. Know. So uh, that's what they do. They they draft really good players all the time. Um, that's yep. yeah. They're just really good at drafting. another team though. I could see like maybe Dallas. They don't really mm -hmm. have a history with Russian players recently, but they they're another team that tends to swing on upside uh, a lot. You know they've got uh, Logan Wyatt Stankovan, Johnson. Wyatt Stankovan, Johnson, yeah. yep. uh, Maverick Bork, guys like that that they've drafted recently. So they're another team that I could see potentially taking a flyer on him, but realistically i think it will be the the hurricanes yeah and the hurricanes are going to continue to be good because they draft good players so uh graham you have said it all you've made your debut on locked on sharks uh you can officially mark this off the uh the old uh to-do list now so you know victory lap uh where can the people find you so you can find me on youtube that's like my main thing uh it is at graham slam uh, I just, my most recent video is my top 32 rankings. Uh, it's not my final rankings or anything like that. I will be releasing more rankings. Uh, one more before the draft, probably, you know, a week or two before the draft. Uh, so look out for that. You can also find me on Twitter at GramSlamYT, uh, Dauber Prospects, of course. Um, I also occasionally write for halfwallhockey.com, uh, I guess, I believe. You've, you've had... Um, 
Yeah, Keegan you've on. Had yeah. Him, yeah, you've had him on the show before. Um, it's been a while since I've written for that website specifically, but I do uh, write there occasionally. And um, yeah, that's about it. All right. Uh, Graham, thank you so much. Uh, we'll talk to you again soon, buddy. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed my conversation with Graham. Uh, good to have him on the podcast. Uh, you know, definitely want to try to, to get him back on again. Um, you know, Timur Mukhanev, we'll see. The five foot eight thing worries me just a bit, uh, just because uh, we know Miker has been leaning towards much bigger players to kind of complement a lot of the short kings the Sharks already have. Um, but again, sometimes you just have to, you know, just try to pick good players. And I think Mukhanov is going to be a good player. So um, again, we'll be back tomorrow looking at doing a mock draft, you know, a couple of mock drafts, kind of see where the Sharks type of players the Sharks could have available for them at four, uh, 26 and 36. So make sure you guys are following along wherever you get podcasts um, or you can watch on YouTube. You can follow the show on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Locked on Sharks. You can follow me on Twitter at my fry hole. And until tomorrow, bye friends.